John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure from this world. This would be difficult for them. He's been with them for three years, and now he's going to disappear. He's going to be crucified. And so he tells them, do not be troubled. He tells them, John 14, 1, believe in God, believe also in me. He is God. Then he tells them he's going to go to prepare a place for them. And Jesus promises to come again. These are wonderful promises. He tells his disciples in verses 7 through 15, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he says. Then he tells them, if, if we believe in Jesus, we will do the works he does and even greater works. What a promise. And then he tells them when a believer prays, God will hear and answer so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. These are wonderful promises. And you might think, well, you know, what's the most amazing promise <coughs> the Lord made to his disciples and to us? And I think it's possible the promise we're going to read in just a moment in these verses is the most amazing promise. Now, that's just my opinion. But as we read these verses, I want you to understand who the Holy Spirit is and what he does in our lives. Uh, there's much one could say about this. And you can write a whole book about it. <laughs> I'm not going to go into that much detail. But we will focus on what is said in these verses. Okay, chapter 14, verse 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. You may think, only two verses. Oh, this is going to be a short message today. Well, don't get your hopes up. <laughs> There is much to explore in these verses. <coughs> so first I want to speak about the amazing person of the Holy Spirit. The amazing person of the Holy Spirit. Who is this other helper? Who is this spirit of truth? <coughs> now, the word spirit is a noun, but it's derived from a verb that means to breathe. So it's interesting in Genesis 2, 7, says that the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. So the word for being in that verse is the Hebrew word for soul. So what's the difference between a soul and a spirit? Well, trying to figure that out can be confusing. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that question. Uh, scholars come to some different conclusions, but just keep in mind, God does not have a body like we have. He is a spiritual being. Now, he also comes to live within us, and that's part of what these verses are talking about. Uh, now, I often think of the soul as including the mind, the will, and the emotions, but again, uh, trying to draw, draw distinctions about all this is, is somewhat difficult. So let's move on. Now here's something you may find interesting, I'm not sure, but the Greek language uses uh, three genders. There's masculine, feminine, and what's called neuter. Now, the word for breathe as a verb and as a um, um, or, or a spirit as a noun is in the neuter language, the gender, in the neuter gender. So sometimes when, in, if you're reading it in Greek, it, it, it'll refer to the Holy Spirit, but it's corresponding with the gender of that particular noun. And it may be that it's, you could translate it it if you were translating it literally, but we know the Holy Spirit is not an it. No. And one of the reasons we know this is because there are passages clearly in, in Scripture, 
And I'm gonna mention one to you, John 14, 26. Jesus says there, it's just a few verses more, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And the word he is referring to the spirit, but it's in the masculine gender. So we know that the Holy Spirit is not an it. So here's some reasons we can know that the Holy Spirit is a person. First of all, as I mentioned, the Holy Spirit is referred to as he. And the only exceptions to this is when there's some kind of reference to the word spirit and the word spirits in the neuter gender. Secondly, we can know the Holy Spirit is a person because he does personal acts. In 1 Corinthians 12, 11, he said to be at the work, be at work in the Christian, imparting spiritual gifts to help build up the church. It says there in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, all these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them, that is the gifts, to each man just as he determines. So each person receives a gift from the Holy Spirit as a Christian. Uh, I don't know what your gift is for sure, but uh, I, I know have an idea of what some of mine are, uh, or maybe one or two, you know. It, it's, uh, and that can be a, a different study for a different time about gifts of the Spirit. But here's, here's something else to, that helps us know the Spirit is a person. He is one with the Father and one with the Son. <laughs> The Son is a person, God the Father is a person, so the Holy Spirit is a person. Here's another way we can know that the Spirit is a person. In Acts chapter 5, you might remember there's a story about a man named Ananias and his wife, I think her name was Sapphira, and they uh, claimed to have sold some land and gave all of it to the church, but they lied. And Peter said to them, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? He said this to Ananias. And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. In verse, in the, in the, earlier, he says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So the Holy Spirit is a person, and he is God. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's as much God as God the Father, God the Son. I don't fully understand the Trinity, but there is one God who exists as three distinct persons. All right? And you may say, well, I already know this. That's great, I hope you do. Why spend so much time with these questions? I believe it's very important for us to understand who the Holy Spirit is and what is his work for today. And these, this is part of what <coughs> Jesus speaks about in these verses. So I want to turn from the amazing person of the Holy Spirit to the amazing promise of the Holy Spirit. Look again at verses 16 and 17. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. So Jesus will ask God the Father to give the Holy Spirit to his disciples. Listen, this is so important. He will be with them forever. Never think for a moment that you could lose your salvation if you have truly received Christ as your Savior. God gives you the Holy Spirit and he will be with you forever. Forever is eternal, everlasting. And then notice Jesus says in verse 17, he abides with you and will be in you. The 
Does this mean the Holy Spirit was with them, but not in them yet? Well, it seems like that's what Jesus is saying. That the Holy Spirit was with them, but he was not yet in them. Consider John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, where Jesus says, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So from that verse, and from what we read just a moment ago in John 14, it appears that the Spirit was with them, but not in them. So this raises a big question, and scholars come to different answers about it. Uh, so I've, as I think about this, I wonder, well, how much time do they have? <laughs> you know, how much do you want to hear about this? I'll just kind of give you the, the gist of it, the summary of it. Uh, some would say, well, in the Old Testament, people were saved by grace through faith, just like we are. I agree. I agree. Uh, except, then the question comes, did the Holy Spirit come in them as he comes into our hearts today? And some would say yes, but there's other reasons to think maybe the answer is no. So how did the work of the Holy Spirit differ in the Old Testament than from the New Testament? Well, again, the scholars come to different conclusions, but oftentimes in the Old Testament, what I find is the Holy Spirit came on people. It's very seldom. In fact, I've only found one place where it says the Holy Spirit was in someone. And I'll talk about that verse in a moment. But uh, some Old Testament scholars do believe that the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit indwelled the true believers. But I've only found one passage that indicates that, and listen to it. It's in Numbers 27, verses 18 through 20. The Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him, a man in, in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him, and have him stand before Eliezer the priest and before all the <coughs> congregation, and commission him in their sight. You shall put some of your authority on him in order that all the congregation of the sons of Israel may obey him. Now, it may say, you may say, well, that's clear the Spirit was in Joshua. But there's also a question here of whether this is a reference to a spirit of leadership in him. It's not real clear. And furthermore, if the Spirit was in Joshua, the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit was in all believers then why does this make it sound exceptional that the Holy Spirit is in Joshua when in fact the Holy Spirit was in all true believers at that time? So that's a difficult uh, question I think to ask or answer. Uh, it's not so hard to ask, pardon me. Now there's another question here related to this. In the Old Testament, you have what's called the Holy of Holies. That was understood to be the place where the Holy Spirit of God dwelt, as I understand it. And once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies to burn incense and sprinkle the blood of a sacrificial animal on the mercy seat. By doing so, the high priest atoned for his own sins and those of the people. So why was there a holy place for the high priest to come into if the Holy Spirit was indwelling every believer? Why do I make a big deal about this? I think there's a spiritual truth here that's very important. Where is the temple of the Holy Spirit today? You know, don't you? 
every believer is indwelled by the Holy Spirit and your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit today. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Paul says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the, of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? I like the way one writer put it. What an astonishing saying this is. As truly as the living God dwelt in the Mosaic tabernacle in the temple of Solomon, so truly does the Holy Spirit dwell in the souls of genuine believers. The Holy Spirit dwells in you as a genuine believer. He dwells in me as a genuine believer. To me, that's why this promise is so amazing. God indwelt the Holy of Holies, and now he indwells the body of each true believer. All right, so there are differing opinions, again, about some of these answers to these questions. But here's some things I think we can know for sure. One, any person who is a true believer was saved by grace through faith, whether it was the New Testament or the Old Testament. Listen to Romans 4, 3. Paul says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. You are saved by grace through faith, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Here's something else I think is clear. The work of the Spirit in the New Testament believers is somewhat different in some regard to the Old Testament believers. I personally think the Old Testament believers were not indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I could be wrong. But even those who would say the Old Testament believers were indwelt by the Holy Spirit, they have to say something happened on the day of Pentecost and there's a new work of the Spirit in believers' lives. They still have to agree there's something new that's taking place. So let's move on to uh, the consideration. I call this the amazing performance of the Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit produce, perform, or work in our lives? Again, again there's more that I could, could go into in this one message. But let me just mention in John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34, this is where John the Baptist sees Jesus and he says uh, uh, to his disciples, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel. I came baptizing in water. John testified saying, I have seen the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. So Jesus baptized, was baptized, pardon me, John baptized Jesus in water. But Jesus would baptize in the Spirit. So that raises the question, what is the baptism of the Spirit? This is an important question. Some Christians will tell you today that the baptism of the Spirit is not something you have once you get saved. It's something you have to seek after your salvation. Nowhere does the Scripture command us to be baptized with the Spirit. It commands us to be filled with the Spirit. But nowhere does the Scripture command us to be baptized with the Spirit. Well, listen to uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, which speaks of the baptism of the Spirit. Paul says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, 
whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. We were all baptized into one body. I believe the Apostle Paul here is speaking about the work of the Lord Jesus. The moment that you trusted Christ as your Savior, whether you knew it or not, you were immersed, baptized by the Spirit. Well, Jesus is the one who baptizes, but you were baptized in the Spirit, by means of the Spirit, into the universal body of Christ. I believe that's what... Uh, Paul is saying here each believer at the moment of salvation becomes a part of the universal body of Christ because of the work of Jesus one writer put it this way the baptism of the spirit is experienced by all who believe at the moment of salvation in that baptism believers regardless of nationality and so forth are identified with Christ, baptized into one body, or indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 and 9 says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. I want us to be sure we understand as much as we can the truth. The Holy Spirit indwells you as a believer. Now, do I fully understand all that? No. <laughs> and that's why I'm looking at these verses and seeking to understand and share them with you. But God, the <laughs> Holy Spirit, indwells you. He is in you as a believer. Now, here's something else that's interesting. Uh, this uh, word for, well, depending on the version you're using, the translation you're using, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. That's the New American Standard updated. The NRSV, New, New Revised Standard Version says, he will give you another advocate. The New International Version says, he will give you a counselor, another counselor, and the list could go on <laughs> about that. In other words, there's a question here. How is the best way to translate this word? It's the, uh, the word parakletos in Greek. Uh, what's the best way to translate this? You see, literally, parakletos means someone called to one side. Called to one side. The Holy Spirit is on your side now. Once you become a believer, he indwells you. He will be your comforter. He will be your advocate. Uh, oftentimes this word is used in a court of justice to denote a legal assistant, uh, the counsel for the defense, one who pleads another's cause, and, and the Holy Spirit uh, does pray for us. <coughs> The Holy Spirit of God, God himself, indwells each believer. To me, that's amazing. Now, by the way, it says another helper. Here's something interesting. Uh, there's two Greek words that I'm aware of that can mean another. Okay? So one is another of the same kind. So if, if, uh, if there were two of us preachers standing up here, I would say, brother so-and-so is another preacher. He's another of the same kind, but there's not. Uh, so there's another word for another that is, uh, uh, it's heteros in the Greek. We, we use that when we speak about uh, heterodoxy. That's a, another teaching that's not uh, from the scripture, uh, or we might speak of uh, heterosexual. Uh, that's someone who's of a different sexual nature than so uh, right now up on the platform you have a preacher and a pulpit they're 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 not others of the same kind they're of a different <coughs> kind 
Now you could say, well, preacher, I think you have a wooden head. I appreciate you not saying that. But anyway, so, but in this case, when Jesus says another helper, he's saying another of the same kind. Just as Jesus helped his disciples, the Holy Spirit of God would be helping us in the same way. So, in a sense, the Holy Spirit replaces Jesus. We cannot have the physical Jesus with us. The Holy Spirit indwells us, and he is God. He's invisible. The world can't see him. Um, the world, we, we need to live by faith and not by sight. We need to trust God and believe what his word says. But the world lives by sight. They don't trust God. They, they do what they think is best according to what they see and what they think. So how do we apply these words to our lives? Okay, so I'm getting close to the, thanks for sticking, staying with me. I'm getting close to the end here. How do we apply these words to our lives? Have you heard of the novel called In His Steps? In His Steps. It was written in 1896. It sold tens of millions of copies. It became one of the best selling books of all times. Here's a summary of, of what the, the book is about. Uh, there was a preacher named Charles Sheldon in Topeka, Kansas. And he wanted to share the word of God with his people in a little different way than just preaching. So he wrote a novel. And in this novel, uh, the basic gist of it is he challenges, uh, he, he, he makes up this uh, a preacher with, by the name of Reverend Maxwell. Again, it's a novel, but the, the Reverend Maxwell cha challenges his church members to ask the question, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And then he bases his story uh, of the novel, in the novel, about what these people did based on what Jesus would do. And you can see it still has a lasting influence. <laughs> I mean, I, I talked earlier with the children about WWJD. What would Jesus do with these bracelets? It was based on this novel. Now, I think that's a good question to ask, but let me just mention <coughs> some difficulties as we think about that question. First, can we always know what Jesus would do if he were here? I'm not sure. <laughs> sometimes God is the God of surprises. Uh, sometimes uh, things go differently than what we expect but God's in control, he's sovereign, and he knows what's going on. Uh, it's a good question to, eat, to ask, what would Jesus do if he's here? But sometimes I don't think we can know. Second, if we knew what Jesus would do, can we do it? Uh, in my own strength and wisdom, I know I can't do what Jesus would want me to do. So that's another question. Third, and to me this is a very important question, by asking what would Jesus do if he's here, it's almost like you're saying he's not here. The truth is Jesus is here. You as a believer are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Christ is in you, the scripture says. He is in you. He's here with us. So that's why I think it's better to ask a question like this. Instead of what would Jesus do if he's here, um, what would Jesus have me do? What would Jesus have me do? And then I can go to the scriptures and I can find out what Jesus commands us to do. He commands us to be a witness to those around us. He commands us to love God with all our heart and to love our neighbors ourselves. And I could go on with the list of, of what he commands us to do. He commands us, um, I believe it's clear from scripture, he wants us to spend time with in his word. 
He wants us to pray. He wants us. And yes, Jesus would pray. So, you know, uh, I understand. What would Jesus do is a good question. But to me, it's more clear, what would Jesus have me do as we read the scripture? And I'm glad you're here to worship today, the Lord, because I know that's something he wants you to do. He wants to for us to join together in worship, assemble not, what's the scripture, uh, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And also know, if you've never accepted Jesus as your savior, he wants you to do that. I know he wants you to do that. Uh, if you have sin in your life, I know he wants you to turn from that sin, confess it, agree with him that what you're doing is sinful, ask his forgiveness, he'll forgive you and then seek to fully surrender to him. I know that's something he wants you to do, fully surrender to him, and the Holy Spirit of God comes to live within us to help us do these things that we could not do without his help. Our Lord is with us. Yes, it would have been wonderful to walk with Jesus and listen to him, but the disciples often couldn't figure out what he was saying. <laughs> The Holy Spirit indwells me. I'm not always sure that I'm listening to him as I need to be. He is willing to speak to us if we're willing to listen. I'm not saying it's some audible voice. I'm not saying uh, some scripture, <coughs> new scripture the right to write down. I'm saying he will guide us, convict us of things we need to do if we're willing to listen to him. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, I'm so thankful for what this wonderful promise. Your spirit is within us. Christ is within us. Oftentimes we may just hear this and take it for granted and not really seek to understand what it means that you are within us. Lord, I pray that if someone here needs to make a decision, that you'll speak to their hearts and they'll be willing to do what you want them to do, whatever that may be. Lord, I pray you'll have your way in our hearts as we sing a hymn of invitation here in just a moment. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?